Due to the nature of this episode, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of murder, sexual assault, kidnapping, bodily harm, and child abuse. Consider this when deciding how and when you'll listen. To get help on mental health and domestic violence, visit spotify.com slash resources. Standing on the roadside in a desolate stretch of Portland, Carol Dundam was ready to call it a night. With the hot summer weather, business was slow. But the thought of next month's rent loomed large. All she needed was one more client to make this shift worth it. She squinted against the setting sun as a truck cruised towards her. It looked familiar. When she saw the driver, she smiled. It was Steve. This was perfect. Steve was a regular customer who was easygoing, polite, and paid well. Sure, he had his quirks. They all did but she could handle it. When he slowed down, Carol winked at him and grabbed the door handle. But he gave her a strange look in return, not a friendly one. For a second, Carol felt the hairs on the back of her neck stand on end. She paused, weighing her options. Then she pulled open the door and climbed inside. After all, she figured, better the devil you know. Hi, I'm Vanessa Richardson. This is Serial Killers, a Spotify podcast. Every Monday, we dive into the minds and madness of serial killers. Today, we're continuing our discussion of Dayton Leroy Rogers, the Malala Forest murderer. I'm here with my co-host, Greg Polson. Last week, we explored Dayton's repressive religious upbringing, where he was emotionally and physically harmed by his fundamentalist father. We also discussed how Dayton grew into an unstable young man with a deep-seated rage towards women. Today, we'll see Dayton's violent impulses grow stronger through his 20s, even as he tried to conceal them. Then we'll explore how his double life ultimately led to a vicious murder spree in the woods near Malala, Oregon. We've got all that and more coming up. Stay with us. This episode is brought to you by Capital One. With no fees or minimums, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than deciding to listen to another episode of your favorite podcast. And with no overdraft fees, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank. Capital One N.A. Member FDIC. You know your favorite superheroes now. So Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, Hulk. But Marvel's path to dominating the box office wasn't an easy one. Oh, it was a real gut punch. We were a nothing company. He developed a fire in his belly of hatred. From the Journal, a new four-part series with great power, The Rise of Superhero Cinema. Find it in the Journal feed on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey there. This is Jonathan Goldstein, host of Heavyweight, with some exciting news. Heavyweight is now available for free wherever you get your podcasts. What this means is that you can listen to any episode from any season on any podcast platform. This goes for the new season as well, which starts in September and will be available everywhere. Start polishing your earbuds. It is going to be a doozy. Dayton Leroy Rogers grew up believing that marriage would solve all of his problems. His fundamentalist father, Ortis, drilled this into him from birth, preaching about the importance of family values, even as he terrorized his own children. But less than two months into his second marriage, Dayton realized things were more complicated than that. His new wife, Sherry, had seemed so innocent at first, so unlikely to challenge him. Yet in December 1975, they had yet another blazing argument. Sherry confronted him about his late night activities and he stormed out. Now, Dayton found himself on a darkened highway on the outskirts of Salem, Oregon, transfixed by a parked car on the side of the road. Inside was an 18-year-old woman. We don't know her name, so we'll refer to her as Angela. Though they hadn't exchanged a word yet, Dayton may have already jumped to a lot of conclusions about Angela. At an early age, he was taught that unmarried women were untrustworthy and that the only respectable kind of woman was a housewife and mother. To him, the fact that Angela was out here at night alone made her fair game. 
Dayton parked a few yards in front of Angela. Then he walked towards her car. Angela was startled by the sight of this stranger, but Dayton smiled reassuringly. Another lesson from his childhood, a man could get away with just about anything, so long as you maintained the right appearance. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but we have done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. Murderers often use a facade of normalcy to ensnare their victims. In a 2014 dissertation, sociology and criminal justice doctoral candidate Marianne Stone White used Dayton as one of many case studies. Both she and author Dr. Dwayne L. Daubert pointed out that Dayton's gregarious personality put his victims at ease because he didn't fit the mold of what anybody expected a killer to look like. Dayton was clearly charismatic. After all, he had no trouble persuading multiple women to marry him. And at 22, his youth was also a factor. When he walked up to Angela's car, she may have seen him as a peer, not a creepy older man approaching her on a darkened road. And Dayton made sure to help that impression along. After introducing himself, he explained he was from out of town and asked her, where does anyone go to have fun around here? There must be some local hangouts for young people like us. Angela said there were, but she couldn't get into any. They all carded, and she was only 18. That's why she was out there alone. She wasn't ready to go home, but had nowhere to go. With an eye roll, Dayton told her he knew what that was like. He said, screw those bars, they'd make their own fun. He had weed in his car if she wanted to take a drive. According to Angela, she followed Dayton back to his Chevy Malibu and hopped into the passenger seat. He flashed her an easy grin and started the engine. After stopping at a store for beer, they drove around aimlessly, passing a joint back and forth. Angela told Dayton she wanted to get her parents a dog for Christmas, specifically an Irish setter, but she'd lost her job as a waitress recently, so money was tight. Seizing the opportunity, Dayton told her he had some puppies at his aunt and uncle's house. Since they were friends, he'd give her one for free. All she had to do was come and collect it. Though it was late, he said the house was close, near the city of Woodburn. To Angela, it felt like kismet. So they set off, heading north on I-5. But soon, Dayton took an exit onto a side road, which seemed to lead away from civilization. They drove for another few minutes before Dayton pulled onto a gravel road and parked. Angela looked around, growing uneasy. There were no houses anywhere in sight. With a nervous laugh, she asked where his aunt and uncle's place was. But Dayton didn't reply. Then he was on her. According to Angela, he grabbed a hold of her and forced her into the back seat of the car. He told her that if she struggled, he'd hurt her even more. He grabbed a bundle of electric wire from the floor of his car and tied Angela's wrists and ankles. Even through the haze of horror and trauma, Angela knew that she had to get away. Dayton had transformed before her the friendly warmth in his eyes extinguished. When he had threatened her, she knew in her bones that he meant it. After the attack, Angela convinced Dayton to untie her, pretending that she needed to pee. He undid the electrical cords around her ankles and wrists, and she got out of the car slowly. She walked a few paces, fists clenched at her sides. She glanced back at the car, half expecting Dayton to follow her. He didn't. Then, adrenaline took over. Angela ran as fast as she could, fleeing into the darkness. She sprinted along the frozen ground, her heartbeat pounding in her ears. Finally, she saw a farmhouse in the distance, surrounded by sprawling fields. By now, it was early in the morning, close to 5 a.m. Angela ran up to the house and pounded on the front door, screaming for help. When the bleary-eyed homeowner finally answered, they were horrified by what she told them. They ushered Angela inside and called the police. Within minutes, two sheriff's deputies arrived at the house to interview Angela. Despite being in shock, she was able to give them a detailed description of Dayton's car, a blue Chevy Malibu. A cop searched the area and he didn't have to look for long. A short distance from the assault, he saw Dayton's Chevy stuck in a patch of mud. Dayton was sitting in the passenger seat. It seems he might have made a half-hearted attempt to push his car out before just giving up. The officer detained him since he was accused of rape. But during a police interview later that day, he insisted that he and Angela had consensual sex. 
Ultimately, Dayton was released while the authorities considered the case. He went home to Sherry. He didn't tell his wife what had happened, but when she inevitably found out, he insisted it was a case of mistaken identity that had soon be straightened out. However, in January 1976, he was indicted on a charge of first-degree rape. The authorities may have determined that he didn't pose a threat to the general public because he was allowed to remain free until his trial, which was set for that May. But that proved to be a deadly mistake. Coming up, Dayton slips through the cracks of the legal system. Hi, listeners. It's Vanessa here with some big news for fans of our show. You can now listen to Serial Killers anywhere you get your podcasts. To our loyal listeners who've stuck with us over the years, thank you. We owe this incredible opportunity to you. And to anyone discovering the Serial Killers podcast for the first time, welcome. We can't wait to bring gripping crime stories straight to your favorite podcast platform, wherever that may be. If you're looking for ways to support the show, head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a review and let everyone know your favorite podcast is now available everywhere. On a personal note, in my recording booth at home, I have dozens of wonderful reviews left by all of you. It means the world to me. Catch new episodes every Monday and listen free anywhere you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Capital One. With no fees or minimums, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than deciding to listen to another episode of your favorite podcast. And with no overdraft fees, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank. Capital One N.A. Member FDIC. Now back to the story. In the winter of 1975, 22-year-old Dayton Leroy Rogers was accused of sexually assaulting a woman while on parole for another attack. Now his freedom was in jeopardy. With his rape trial three months away, the smart thing to do would be to lay low. But Dayton had never been one to do the smart thing. Especially not when he was angry. Far from feeling guilty about what he'd done to Angela, he resented her for what she'd done to him. He'd spent so long convincing the police that the sex had been consensual, maybe he even started to believe it himself. After all, he thought, what kind of a woman sits alone in her car in the middle of the night if she's not looking to get picked up? His wounded rage built up in the weeks following his indictment. And one night in February, he couldn't hold back any longer. According to a 19-year-old woman whom we'll call Sally, Dayton picked her up on a highway close to Salem, Oregon that evening. He allegedly sexually assaulted Sally, then told her he had to kill her. His last victim had gone to the police, and he couldn't risk that happening again. Dayton strangled Sally, but she fought him off. She grabbed one of her shoes and hit him with it. He retreated right away. In fact, he seemed almost afraid of her. Perhaps it had never crossed his mind that a woman would defend herself. Sally persuaded Dayton to drop her off at her grandmother's house, swearing that she wouldn't tell anybody about what happened. But as soon as she was inside and safe, she called the police. Although a deputy took her statement that night, the incident report didn't reach local detectives until the following Tuesday, four days after the attack. And unfortunately, this delay gave Dayton the opportunity to strike again. A few days after picking up Sally, Dayton took a morning drive through Salem. At some point, he saw two teenage girls on the side of the street. They'd had car trouble, so they were walking to high school. Dayton pulled over and offered them a ride flashing his trademark smile. Since they were late, the teens jumped in without hesitation. But instead of taking them to school, Dayton headed in the opposite direction. He drove the girls around for several hours, making excuses for the detour. Along the way, he bought them burgers and offered them beer. Eventually, though, he dropped the facade. Dayton pulled out a knife and told them that if they did exactly as he said, he wouldn't hurt them. He allegedly sexually assaulted one of the girls and then let them both go after giving them a fake name, Steve Davis. This half-hearted attempt to cover his tracks didn't quite work. The next day, the two victims told the police what happened. It didn't take long for the cops to connect this and the attack on Sally back to Dayton, given that he was awaiting trial on a similar assault against Angela. He was indicted on three new counts of rape 
With four victims alive and able to tell their stories in detail, the case against him seemed ironclad. And yet, Dayton was acquitted on all three counts of rape. Unfortunately, this was a relatively common outcome for sexual assault trials at the time. According to a local district attorney, juries often felt that if a woman or girl contributed to the rape in any way, they would not convict him. In this case, I think it was because they drank beer and smoked marijuana with him. There are plenty of reasons why a person might act friendly even when they're uncomfortable. Along with fight, flight, flop, or freeze, researchers have discovered a fifth possible response to danger, fawn. In a fawn response, a person attempts to placate the one threatening them. When the teenagers were trapped in a car with a stronger, older man, it's easy to see why they went along with him. By the time they knew something was wrong, refusing might have put them at even more risk. The jury's decision to acquit Dayton of rape disappointed many in local law enforcement. John L. Collins, the district attorney we quoted before, wrote to the state parole board, describing Dayton as one of the most dangerous people he had ever encountered in his career. Another DA echoed this sentiment, writing, This man is an extreme danger to the community, particularly young women. He is both sexually and physically violent, and without question, is a murder case looking for a place to happen. Thankfully, Dayton was found guilty of coercing the two victims into his car and sentenced to 10 years. But he was released on parole in January 1982, about six years later, when he was 28. And a year after that, his parole supervision was terminated. So now there was nobody to keep an eye on him. Except, that is, for Sherry. Despite all she'd been through, Sherry still stuck by her husband. For better or worse, she believed in him and had faith he could turn his life around. And for a while, Dayton made an effort to live up to that belief. With some help from Sherry's dad, Dayton started his own engine repair business, Small Engine Repair Unlimited. Having repeatedly failed to hold down a job in his early 20s, he finally found the discipline to show up for a 9-to-5. More than that, he was a business owner now, a pillar of the community. Around the same time, he and Sherry had their first child, cementing what seemed to be a quiet, suburban existence. Dayton mastered this facade, but underneath it all, he was still the deeply damaged man he'd always been. For years, his stew of emotions stayed at a low simmer, making it easy for him to stay out of trouble, especially since he had a secret way to blow off steam. At some point, he began leaving the house, often not returning until late at night. He told Sherry he was working. She never imagined that Dayton was leading a double life, complete with an alter ego. Several times a week, Dayton made the 45-mile drive north to Portland, the largest city in Oregon. There, he solicited local sex workers using the name Steve the Gambler. But it wasn't really gambling he was known for. He was a fetishist who could only get sexual gratification if his partner was tied up. He was willing to pay extra for the privilege, and many of the women were happy to cater to his needs. Especially since he was polite and considerate. He always insisted on mixing them a drink beforehand. A screwdriver, made using a carton of OJ and miniature bottles of Smirnoff vodka that he kept in his car. But within five years after Dayton was released from prison, his genial demeanor took a turn. It began with headaches so severe that he could barely function. Last time, we discussed the possibility that Dayton suffered head trauma during childhood beatings from his father, which could have caused headaches. Although they're most common in the first year following a traumatic brain injury, they can linger for years afterward in what's known as a chronic or persistent post-traumatic headache. These headaches seem to coincide with a deterioration in Dayton's mental state, too, and a compulsive, insatiable craving for violence. By the summer of 1987, Portland sex workers warned each other about Steve, sharing stories of being hogtied, then attacked. Carol Dundam was one of them. At some point during that summer, she crossed paths with 33-year-old Dayton and agreed to have sex with him. He was a repeat client of hers, so she thought she knew what she was getting into. She hopped into his truck and let Dayton drive her about 30 miles south of Portland. They stopped in a rural area, not far from the small city of Malala. There, he undressed Carol and bound her hands and feet, just as they'd agreed. But, according to Carol, that's when he went off script. 
With no warning, Dayton punched her in the face. He transformed before her eyes, his face contorted with anger. He called her names, and he told her he was going to cut off her feet. Terrified and crying, Carol tried to appease Dayton, but it was no good. The more scared she got, the more he seemed to enjoy himself. Eventually, Carol was able to get her ankles loose from the restraints and ran for her life. She fled through the wilderness until she made it to a road. Frantic, she flagged down a passing driver, who gave her a ride to a friend's house nearby. For days afterward, Carol couldn't shake the feeling that she'd escaped death by the skin of her teeth. Soon, she would discover just how right she was. In July 1987, 26-year-old sex worker Maureen A. Hodges disappeared from the Portland area. Like many of the victims we're going to discuss, the specifics remain unclear. But based on what we know from Dayton's surviving victims, here's the most likely scenario. Dayton possibly hired Maureen and took her to a secluded area. Just like with Carol, he may have pulled over somewhere in the forests around Malala, tied her up, and fatally stabbed her with a knife. As far as we know, this was the first time he took a life. Afterwards, he left her body on a hillside in the woods and covered it with brush and leaves. Maureen was not in regular contact with her family, so she wasn't reported missing for months. This turned out to be a lucky break for Dayton. Last episode, we discussed how Dayton didn't seem to plan his crimes ahead of time. He acted on instinct, with little concern for the consequences. And now that he knew how easy it was to kill, he went on a rampage. A couple of weeks after Marine's murder in late July, 23-year-old Lisa Marie Mock went out to buy a pack of cigarettes and never came back. Around the same time, 16-year-old Retha Marie Giles vanished. Both were sex workers who had the misfortune of crossing paths with Dayton. After killing Lisa and Retha, Dayton left their bodies in the same woodland area near Malala, hidden in the undergrowth. And then he drove home to his wife and child. But within days, sometimes hours, he'd be restless again, on edge, craving the release he could only get from brutality. And after so many years of holding back, he was no longer going to deny himself. Up next, Dayton gets caught red-handed. Now back to the story. In the summer of 1987, after years of snowballing violent impulses, 33-year-old Dayton Leroy Rogers had launched into a killing spree. We've already described the three murders he committed. And by August, he had kidnapped and killed at least four more sex workers in Portland. 26-year-old Nantes K. Cervantes, 35-year-old Kristen Lotus Adams, 21-year-old Cynthia Diane DeVore, and 18-year-old Tanya Jury Johnston. Though we don't know the details of every murder, it doesn't seem like his M.O. varied much. He'd usually hire his victim, drive her to the woods, tie her up, and stab her to death. Afterward, he left the bodies on the ground, hastily hidden beneath brush and leaves. We may never know how many women Dayton attacked during this vicious summer. In addition to his murder victims, there were about a dozen other sex workers who had terrifying encounters, barely escaping with their lives. Dayton should have been worried about how many witnesses he'd left alive. But maybe he felt that his pseudonym, Steve, was a bulletproof cover. But that was only true if things continued to go according to plan. And given Dayton's sloppiness, it's no surprise that they did not. One evening in August, Dayton was restless again. He knew he wouldn't be able to relax that night. So he made the familiar drive to Portland and stopped in a neighborhood he knew well. It was a stretch of empty storefronts and boarded up windows, an area that sex workers were known to gather. He knew that word had spread. Many of the women wouldn't come near him now. But Portland was huge. If he drove for long enough, he'd find someone willing to take the risk. 26-year-old Jennifer Smith was almost ready to call it a night when she saw Dayton's car approaching. She did recognize Dayton. He'd hired her a couple of times. It's not clear if she'd heard the more recent stories about him, but in her experience, he'd always been friendly, polite, and paid well. So when he pulled over, she climbed into his car. They drove around the city until about 3 a.m. That's when Dayton pulled into a parking lot of a business complex in Oak Grove, a sleepy suburb. It was beside a Denny's restaurant, so it wasn't nearly as secluded as the woods, but it would do. He bound Jennifer's wrists with shoelaces, likely under the pretense of his fetish. 
It was only when she noticed the strange expression in his eyes that she knew something was wrong. And then, Dayton pulled out a knife. As he stabbed her, Jennifer screamed, fighting him off as best she could with her bound hands. She struggled with all her strength, trying to wrestle free. Dayton was so absorbed in the sadistic pleasure of his attack, he didn't notice the shoelaces around her wrists were coming loose. Finally, Jennifer pulled out of the restraints and managed to throw him off. She reached for the passenger door, flung it open, and fell into the darkness. She landed hard on the sidewalk, staggering a little, weakened by blood loss. But pure adrenaline propelled her forward, and she ran, her eyes darting around the parking lot, searching for help. But there was no one around, and suddenly Dayton was behind her. He dragged Jennifer to the ground as she struggled ferociously. He stabbed her again and again until she went limp, no longer able to fight. In the dark parking lot, Dayton almost forgot about the Denny's, which was open 24 hours. And that night, it was busy. Two men left the restaurant right at that moment. As the door swung shut behind them, they heard Jennifer's screams and ran toward the noise. Rounding a corner into the parking lot, they saw Dayton, hunched over Jennifer's motionless, bloodied body. Dayton scrambled to his feet and fled as fast as he could. He made it back to his car and sped towards the freeway. A crowd of horrified witnesses soon gathered in the parking lot. Someone called the police while two other people tried to save Jennifer, putting pressure on her wounds and administering CPR. A few hours later, Jennifer was pronounced dead at a local hospital. This news was devastating to the bystanders who'd worked so hard to save her. By that time, Dayton was already back at his engine repair business, ready to start work for the day. He breathed a sigh of relief. That had been far too close, but he'd made it out and was sure it had been too dark for anyone to identify him. He was wrong. A witness managed to write down his license plate number. And thanks to that tip, by daybreak, the police were able to identify Dayton as the owner of the vehicle. The next morning, they went to the registered address where Sherry told them that Dayton was at his job. Sure enough, that's where the cops found and arrested him. But little did they know, Jennifer's murder was only the tip of the iceberg. Three weeks after Dayton's arrest, A hunter in the Malala forest saw a strange object in the undergrowth, a glimmer of white. Moving closer, he realized it was a human body, the skin ashen and beginning to decompose. A nightmarish, days-long investigation ensued as a team of detectives combed the entire area. Over the next week, they found six more corpses. Authorities collected more than 500 pieces of evidence from the forest and bagged them for analysis. Nothing immediately connected the bodies to Dayton, except for one small detail. Among the items were numerous miniature bottles of Smirnoff vodka. As the victims were gradually identified and police interviewed their friends, they soon learned about Steve the Gambler. The women told stories about his increasingly violent behavior and his signature drink, orange juice and vodka. The small bottles became a huge breakthrough, linking Dayton to the crime scenes. In 1988, Dayton went on trial for killing Jennifer. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Shortly after, he was charged with six additional counts of aggravated murder. During his 1989 trial on the six murder charges, Dayton's defense team discussed how his abusive upbringing shaped his behavior. They noted that a large number of his close relatives suffered from mental illness. They also pointed out that several family members had been prosecuted for sex crimes, painting a portrait of a deeply troubled family that set Dayton up to fail. In an effort to avoid the death penalty, they also argued that Dayton suffered brain damage as a result of his childhood abuse. Allegedly, he had a condition called frontal lobe syndrome, a fairly broad term used to describe damage to higher functioning processes of the brain, like planning, social behavior, and speech. Studies do show that frontal lobe dysfunction correlates with aggressive and antisocial behavior, and it might also explain Dayton's intense headaches, which seemed to worsen with his behavior. But as with any explanation for violent crime, there's a big difference between shedding light on what happened and justifying it. 
However nightmarish Dayton's childhood was, and however damaged his brain may have been, he still had a choice, and he consistently chose destruction. The jury seemed to reach the same conclusion. Dayton was found guilty on all six charges and given a death sentence. As of today, at 69 years old, Dayton is still alive and incarcerated at Oregon's Two Rivers Correctional Institution. But unlike his first stint in prison, there's a major difference. His wife, Sherry, is no longer in the picture. Sherry divorced Dayton not long after he was indicted. And by distancing herself, she did everything she could to spare her young son from his father's horrific influence. Consciously or not, she may have prevented Dayton from handing down the same dark inheritance his own father possibly passed down to him. And so, when Dayton eventually dies behind bars, hopefully his toxicity will die with him. Thanks again for tuning in to Serial Killers. We'll be back soon with another episode. For more information on Dayton Leroy Rogers, amongst the many sources we used, we found Gary C. King's book, Bloodlust, Portrait of a Serial Sex Killer, extremely helpful in our research. You can find all episodes of Serial Killers and all other Spotify originals for free on Spotify. We'll see you next time. Stay safe out there. Serial Killers is a Spotify podcast. Our head of programming is Julian Boireau. Our supervising sound designer is Russell Nash, with Nick Johnson as our head of production, and Spencer Howard as our post-production supervisor. Stacey Nemec is our supervising editor, and Derek Jennings is our writing lead. This episode of Serial Killers was written by Emma Dibdin, edited by Ben Caro and Kate Murdoch, fact-checked by Catherine Barner, researched by Brian Petrus and Chelsea Wood, Produced by Bruce Kitovich and sound designed by Alex Button. Our hosts are Greg Polson and me, Vanessa Richardson. Thank you so much to our fans and to any listeners hearing our show for the first time. Don't forget that you can catch new episodes of the Spotify original Serial Killers free each week, anywhere you get your podcasts. 